Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's good to see you all here today. Jesus is with us. Jesus loves us. The peace of Christ is available to us. Let's live into that peace and share it with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you.
être prêt prions le Seigneur éternel Dieu de toute puissance créateur du ciel et de la terre nous te sommes très reconnaissants ce matin pour t'adorer, te glorifier mon Dieu, mon roi aujourd'hui c'est un jour saint où tout l'univers se réunit devant toi pour élever ton saint nom tu es saint tu es saint tu es saint le Dieu créateur ô oh, Seigneur qui est comme toi Jéhovah Sabaoth qui est comme toi Jéhovah Tchekenouna qui est comme toi Jéhovah Nissi ô oh, Seigneur tu es digne de t'adorer tu es digne de te glorifier tu es digne mon Dieu mon roi Seigneur nous recommandons cette congrégation à traiter cette main que ton Esprit Saint nous guide, que ton Esprit Saint rayonne au milieu de nous, touche nos cœurs, que ta parole sorte avec la puissance du Saint-Esprit et nous donne la lumière, car, Seigneur Jésus, tu es la lumière du monde. Nous recommandons ceux qui sont dans les hôpitaux, Seigneur, que ta main les guérisse, nous recommandons ceux qui sont dans les prisons. Seigneur, sois avec eux. Nous recommandons ceux qui sont dans les gémissements, qui sont dans l'angoisse de la mort. Sois avec eux. Nous recommandons ceux qui sont dans les guerres perpétuées. Ô oh, Seigneur, tu es le sauveur du monde. Bénis cette Église. Bénis les fidèles qui t'adorent jour et nuit partout. Aujourd'hui, sois au milieu de nous. Au nom de notre Seigneur Jésus-Christ, nous prions. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from 2 Corinthians. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, the word of the Lord. <laughs> Please stand if you are able for the reading of the gospel. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe Famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. 
I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off, and he went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother's come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all those years I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord.
St. Paul was keen to teach that when we are in Christo or in Christ, we are a new creation, a people whom God uses to reconcile the world to God. This passage from 2 Corinthians was a favorite of John Wesley. He preached it often because he knew that there was something happening in our lives through the power of Christ that made us a new creation. Unfortunately, over the centuries, this passage gets twisted around usually to dominate and oppress people. The usual narrative that we get in some churches is that we express our belief in Jesus, believe in our hearts, and we're transformed and made so that we're no longer ever inclined to sin again. Our job is to tell others how to live and live properly without sin. But I don't think that's what St. Paul meant. And I don't think that's what Jesus meant either. When we commit our lives to Christ, we're not suddenly made into perfect little angels, if you haven't noticed. We usually experience a relief from our sense of guilt and shame, but we're really not that different in our inclinations. Our personalities remain as they have been before, except that we are more open to the work of the Holy Spirit, bringing about a transformation within us, a process we call sanctification or regeneration and holiness. Over time, we can become more holy, more filled with divine love and fully dependent on that love and letting it flow through us to those around us. We can grow into a new creation by our active engagement with the Spirit. As we allow the Spirit to essentially rearrange the furniture in our souls, in our minds, so that we do become the people that God intends us to be. This, this morning, I'd like to take a little look at this process with you. We can start with this parable that we call the prodigal son, but actually the word prodigal really describes the generosity of the father. Right? He has two sons. One is classically a naughty boy, and the other is an uptight, dutiful fellow. And the naughty son goes off and falls to the lowest possible end place and ends up a swineherd in a foreign country. And then it says, he came to himself. He became conscious of what was going on. He recognized, frankly, that he'd been an idiot. He awoke to the reality of his life and decided to return to his father and to ask forgiveness. He recalled the love of his father and decided he could trust his father's love that it would remain even though he messed up. He was right about his father, wasn't he? The father welcomes him home with joy even before he confesses that he's messed up. Even before he gives the speech that he's planned to give. The message to us is that when we come to ourselves, when we awake to our reality, God is always ready to shower us with abundant love. That love, of course, may not reverse all of the consequences in the world that we have occasioned, but it opens up a whole new life for us of love and hope, a new life that then can grow in us. And it's this point that some folks like to say that the waking up process is simply an admission of our sin and all is well and off we go. But Jesus goes on, doesn't he? He tells us about the other son, the devoted, proper son who never ran off and wasted his money and his life, who kept his nose to the grindstone and did whatever his father expected, the perfect boy. 
right? This guy, this Mr. Perfect, royally pissed off when he discovers that his father has welcomed back the naughty son. How dare you do this? That jerk, what did he do? He burned up your money with prostitutes. He was feeding pig for heaven's sakes. And you're welcoming this dirt bag back into our family? He's really angry. He's so angry that he disrespects his father. He makes his father come out of the house to talk to him. In that culture, that is, <laughs> you don't do that to dad. <laughs> you go to the father to speak. And he refuses. He refuses to join in the joy of his father at the return of the troubled son. So why do we get this part of the story? I think Jesus wants us to recognize that being dutiful and upright and uptight is not the opposite of what the naughty boy did. It's not a choice between following the rules and being a rule breaker. You can be sure that that irritated a few people who listened to this story. In fact, we discover that being dutiful and a rule follower can be very problematic and it can cover up a multitude of sin. The son who was so well behaved has not come to himself. He has not awakened to reality, but he's just lived out of a set of rules and a code of behavior. He's pleasing his father, he thinks, by just following the rules. And this, friends, is the key to living in the new creation. It's not that we confess our sins and suddenly act properly or even just keep ourselves in check so we never act out. It's coming to our senses, waking up and grasping reality that is essential to being a new creation. It may sound like nothing at all, but there are countless people who actually live their entire lives without waking up without coming to themselves, without discovering that they're simply walking through life following a set of forms. Heaven knows that when we go to school, our teachers, God bless you all, you have to put up with us, but when we're in school, we learn to follow the, we might learn to follow the rules, and we follow those rules, and we can get through, and maybe we will be successful. Our parents want us to follow rules because we're driving them nuts. If we don't, follow the rules, please. But there's something more important than following rules. It is waking up to reality. You see, all of us, when we're young, develop a sense of who we are, what our identity is. And the psychologists call that a false self. Jesus talks about the self, this, this thing that we've created as who we are. And we learn how to live life by a set of rules or patterns. At some point in the mid, middle of life, something starts to happen, we discover that it doesn't work very well. Now, if you're like me, you're pretty stubborn and you don't want to accept that fact. It's just other people who are fault, at fault, right? You just follow the rules that I made up, I'm going to be fine, and you people ought to, you know, do it my way. And after you be around people, maybe you get married, you have your own children, you discover this isn't working either. And at some point, you come to that place where you recognize that the person you made yourself to be that person that you designed to cope with life isn't really 
who you need to be. It's not who God intended you to be. And it's like you're dancing on a big dance floor. And you're bumping into people and things aren't going well and it's crowded and you finally say, wait a minute, i got to stop. And you go up in the balcony and you look down on the dance floor and you realize that you've been moving left and everyone else is moving right. You're dancing the wrong dance. You're too flamboyant or who knows. But you see what's happening on the dance floor and you go, oh, what I thought was my dance turns out to not work. I need to see this again. And we get a different perspective on life from that place. We get consciousness of who we are and how we're living our lives. We come to ourselves and we can then change how we live the day and how we do the dance that's before us. Most of us don't even know we're living out of a false self. It's the person we think we look at when we look in the mirror. Those of us who, you know, get married, usually somebody's there to say, I don't think so. <laughs> Parents will sometimes uh, do that with us, but of course they're wrong. <laughs> Our children will turn around and tell us that, but of course they're wrong, right? But eventually, it might dawn on us that we're ready to be different, that we can in fact discover something else. And what we do is instead of following the self that we created, instead of letting that just run in our lives, we can open up and let the Holy Spirit guide us. We can lean into God. We can let God move us in a new place and in a new way. We can, we can change how we live. When we went to Germany, we had a, a wonderful time. And we were, courtesy of one of our relatives, introduced something called the uh, dark shopping center in English. So we went downstairs in this building in the city, and we walk in, and this guy takes our money and, um, and then takes us into darkness. Total darkness. It turns out, so, so he takes us in and he says, now keep your hand to the left and follow the wall so you know where you are. So we are following the wall in total darkness and there's sort of a maze. And as we get in and he introduces us to sounds, different sounds, so we say, oh, well, that's a this and that's a that. And, and then smells and we, oh, that's this and that's that. And, um, and then touch. And he comes around with a, a thing and we try to determine what it is and there it's very funny because we have different answers for what this is and um, <clears throat> and then gradually moves us to a bar you know where there is uh, we sit we find chairs and we sit down and uh, he says now would you like to have coffee tea or soda or something and so we say, okay, we order, and then he says, now we'll be paying. So uh, I'm feeling in my pocket, and fortunately I do pay attention to things like the shape of coins, and so I know what's five euros and what's one euro and what's 50 cents, and so I pay. And he hands somebody a, a euro bill, a five euro bill, and says, is this money or just paper? So we're, we're doing all this in pitch black, and we realize that this guy is blind. And we have not learned what it is like to be blind, but we have learned what it is like to be without sight and to have to depend upon other senses to discover what's, what's real, what's going on, where we are and who we are. And this is what it's like when we start to come to ourselves and we realize that we've, we've seen everything in a certain way and then, wait a minute, there's a whole other dimension to life. That's what the 
naughty son in Jesus' parable had to do. He had to go, wait a minute. I thought I knew what I was doing, but I don't. And the other brother, the older brother, of course, being a first son, I can relate to that. The one who thought he knew everything. He needed also to come to discover that just being dutiful is really not being awake, being alive. It's depending on ourselves and our capacity to follow rules rather than to depend upon God and God's love. And when we discover that we can lean on God, what a wonderful experience this is, that we can trust God to lead us in the dark places, that even though we go into a territory that's unfamiliar to us, God is with us. We do not know where we're going, but we know that we should put this foot, the right foot forward or the left foot forward. We're invited by God to trust God, to walk with God, like a person who puts on a blindfold and is led by a friend. You have to trust, right? Or those games that they put people through where you fall backward and expect somebody to catch you, right? These are the things that move us into a real trust of God. We will all reach this place at least once in life. We'll find ourselves failing. Our relationships go south. Our jobs are not what we hoped or they go away. The money runs out. Our identities formed when we were teenagers slip away as our bodies sag and our youth disappears. The old us no longer satisfies and no longer seems to get us where we thought we'd be going. And then, despite the pain, and yes, there is pain in this, we discover a new creation, that we are made new in Christ, that God has intended for us a life that we had not even seen before, that the Spirit is at work within us so that the love of Christ can fill us and overflow us when we feel most empty. Dear ones, this is rebirth, regeneration, the start of holiness. This is the invitation that Christ gives us. We live in challenging times. I see things in the news that I just never imagined could be, and yet they happen. We are in a different world than I anticipated, my parents anticipated. The world is changing fast and not necessarily for the better. But we have God. When we lean into God, a new newness comes to us and enables us to face the future unafraid, with joy, with hope, in fellowship with one another. This is what Christ offers to us. May we go forth in thankfulness. Amen.
the offering is uh, one of those things where, you know, the old joke as the pastor preaches for an hour and then just takes the offering home and that's all there is to it, you know, the job. <laughs> no. The offering really isn't even so much about the money. The offering is about offering ourselves to God. The joy of generosity that God inspires in us to return ourselves to God, to, to give ourselves to God. And uh, yes, it includes our resources. And so in our African church, people dance. It is such a joy to give. People who often have next to nothing are bringing what they can to share this joy of giving. And if you don't want to dance, that's OK. You don't even have to come forward. There's another one of these dishes sitting up back. You can put it in there on your way out. But it's an opportunity to be joyful in generosity. I invite your generous response. This is the point in our service that we call Thanksgiving. For 2,000 years, people have come to a place in the service where it's all about Thanksgiving. And we call this the great Thanksgiving, the opportunity to give thanks and to experience the presence of God in the world, in our history, and in these simple foods. But even if we don't experience God in some other way, we experience God in simple bread and juice. And so this table is open for everyone to come and be thankful and to experience the presence of God. After our prayers together, you're invited to come forward and to receive. You may stand or kneel, and if you need gluten-free, it will be on my left. Just ask for it. And maybe you can take those plates and put them on the pew. Okay. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give effects to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. 
It is all right, a good, a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give effects to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. In love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, your love remains steadfast. You bid your people cleanse their hearts, prepare with joy for the Easter feast, that renewed by your word and sacraments and fervent in prayer and works of justice and mercy, we may come into the fullness of grace that you have prepared for those who love you. So with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna in, in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in, in the, the highest. highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. He whom you sent in the fullness of time to redeem the world. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and being born in our likeness, humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He took upon himself our sin and death and offered himself a perfect sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you have given birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. This is the point in our service that we call Thanksgiving. For 2,000 years, people have come to a place in the service where it's all about Thanksgiving, and we call this the Great Thanksgiving, the opportunity to give thanks and to experience the presence of God in the world, in our history, and in these simple foods. But even if we don't experience God in some other way, we experience God in simple bread and juice. And so this table is open for everyone to come and be thankful and to experience the presence of God. After our prayers together, you're invited to come forward and to receive you may stand or kneel, and if you need gluten-free, it will be on my left. Just ask for it. And maybe you can take those plates and put them on the pew. Okay. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. We give our thanks and praise. It is all right, a good, <clears throat> a joyful thing always and everywhere to give effects to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. In love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, your love remains steadfast. You bid your people cleanse their hearts, prepare with joy for the Easter feast that renewed by your word and sacraments and fervent in prayer and works of justice and mercy, we may come into the fullness of grace that you have prepared for those who love you. So with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. He whom you sent in the fullness of time to redeem the world. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and being born in our likeness, humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He took upon himself our sin and death and offered himself a perfect sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you have given birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave effects to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take it. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this 
in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave effects to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant pour out for you and for many for forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ this has died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Pour out to you, Holy Spirit, on us gather here and on this gift of bread and wine. Make them before the body and blood of Christ, that we may before the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory, and we first at his heavenly banquet, through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The bread of life for the new body of Christ. Amen. 